Well, tonight here on Sky at 9 p.m., Chris Kenny hosts a special on The Voice. And he's got some good people lined up to debate it, including Jacinta Price and Andrew Bolt, who I imagine will be speaking against it, though who knows? And Dean Parkin and Shereen Morris. It'll be great TV. But I was slightly disturbed by Chris Kenny's regular column in the Australian newspaper yesterday, in which he discussed The Voice. Quite rightly, the article kicked off by lambasting Anthony Albanese and Linda Burney for their ridiculous and frankly moronic stunt with black American basketballer Shaquille O'Neal last week, in which the African-American celebrity rapper, sportsman and promoter of an online gambling network gave the official Shaquille O'Neal seal of approval to the constitutional Indigenous voice to Parliament. As Kenny correctly noted, that stunt saw, quote, decades of consideration, activism, compromise and consensus building being squandered for the sake of a picture opportunity with a former US basketball star turned online gambling spruker, end of quotes. Kenny goes on to draw the same conclusion that I drew during the week on my 9pm show here on Sky, although I was far less diplomatic about it than Kenny is, that Shaquille O'Neal was only there because his skin is black. No other reason. His only qualification for commenting on or approving of The Voice is because he is black. I would know more about the indigenous Orang Asli of Malaysia, I imagine, than Shaquille <laughs> O'Neal knows about the complex <laughs> and horrendous circumstances that many indigenous Australians, particularly women and children, are forced to live in thanks to the idiotic and racist policies of successive Australian governments going right back to the Whitlam years when they were first introduced. O'Neill was there because his skin is black. He has no more in common with Indigenous Australians than he has with the Dalai Lama. Chris Kenny recognises this and is furious that Albanese's woeful stunt has reinforced the impression that the voice is tokenistic and that if the public come to view it as such, it will fail. Why change the Constitution for a stunt, Chris Kenny asks. Precisely. Why indeed? But Chris Kenny then goes off the rails, in my opinion. He claims that the debate should be one of substance, which he conflates with the fact that Many activists, academics, politicians and others, including himself, by the way, have toiled away for many years to get to this point and therefore we should just accept all their hard work and give their proposal the nod at a referendum. Quote, The only outstanding question, Kenny asserts, is whether a voice is enshrined in the Constitution as a substantive act of recognition. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are plenty of other outstanding questions, Chris, but Chris Kenny doesn't ask them. Instead, he makes what I regard as a ludicrous assertion, namely that it is, quote, obscene to liken the voice proposal to apartheid. Chris Kenny writes, quote, opponents should not flippantly throw around the toxic tag of apartheid. It is obscene to liken a well-reasoned project <laughs> aimed at redressing disadvantage and creating equality of opportunity to an abhorrent system of organised discrimination and repression. End of quotes. Well, seeing as The Spectator Australia, of which I am the editor, ran a cover two weeks ago making that very assertion with a superb cover image showing the map of Australia replaced with a map of apartheid Australia, apartheid from coast to coast, I would have to strongly disagree with Mr Kenny. What Chris and those supporting The Voice cannot answer and refuse to acknowledge is that enshrining a legal entity into the Constitution that has undefined and therefore unrestricted powers that for all time will be able to exert unique influence over any and all of our laws and that that legal entity is open only to members mm. whose sole qualification to make those judgments is that they claim to be from one particular race. 
That, by definition, is racist. And by definition, gives that race the unique ability to influence or implement laws or policies that pertain to all other races. Yes, of course, the tag of apartheid is toxic. The word itself means separateness. And it was an abhorrent form of government in South Africa, based entirely on the principle that one race had superior or special political rights and insights above all the others. Chris Kenny goes on to dismiss as facile and lazy my claim that the voice is racist. Although he fails to explain why it isn't racist to have people elevated solely on the colour of their skin, as Albo mm -hmm. and Bernie deliberately chose to do with Shaquille O'Neal. Hey, look, Linda, there's a famous celebrity in town and he's black. You beauty, let's get him to support The Voice. Don't now bleat about the whole thing being seen as racist when it clearly is. Or take a look across at New Zealand, where actions by the Labour Party are now entrenching racial division with a mm -hmm. whole raft of separate mm -hmm. new Maori powers and rights. And this is what is so wrong about this proposal for The Voice. It conflates two very separate ideas, an emotional, symbolic idea with a solid institutional proposal both of which independently are essentially harmless. Bring them together into one object and you have a dangerous legal nightmare, as has been well documented by many legal minds. Yes, let's have Indigenous Australians recognised in the Constitution in a symbolic manner such as that proposed by Tony Abbott. His proposal recognises Indigenous Australians, settlers and migrants in one beautiful but purely symbolic preamble. No reasonable person can object to that. And yes, if we want, let's have another crack in an ATSIC 2.0, a body, an institution, preferably without the corruption of the last one, if that's what people want, a new representative lobby group that can argue with a powerful voice on behalf of Indigenous groups, like unions do, like business groups do, like environmental groups do. You can set it up tomorrow. Maybe Twiggy Forrest could stump up a lazy billion or so instead of us taxpayers having to shelve it out. He seems to have plenty of dosh to throw around on woke virtue signalling, which is what such a body would ultimately probably be. Again, I doubt an ATSIC 2.0 would do much good. But at least let's try it out, and if it's no good, we'll be able to disband it. But it's the fusion of these two very separate notion, notions, one symbolic, one legal, into this one permanent and irreversible entity that is so utterly objectionable. Trading off the feel-good emotion of a symbolic idea to entrench a racially based political entity with undefined and therefore potentially unrestricted and unlimited power to influence and interfere in the democratically elected parliamentary process with no easy way of abolishing it. That utterly untested and unproven proposal is reckless beyond belief, dangerous, and yes, Chris Kenny, lazy. Because despite all these well-meaning academics and advocates slaving away for decades, on the whole preamble slash voice slash Uluru slash recognition concept, not a single one of them has yet been able to describe one, just one tangible way in which this well-reasoned project of theirs will genuinely redress Indigenous disadvantage and genuinely create equality of opportunity for young Aborigines that they could not otherwise have. Not one. Indeed, here's where even Green Senator Lydia Thorpe and Coalition Senator Jacinta Price are on the same page in opposing what will undeniably be a monumentally expensive vanity project that will see plush buildings built in capital cities, all sorts of high-paid jobs for activists and academics, and no doubt a plethora of eye-wateringly expensive Indigenous artworks 
hanging on the walls, with taxpayers' cash being splashed around that should and could have been spent directly raising the education and health standards of Indigenous Australians, improving and even dramatically changing the appalling management of some remote communities and creating real, meaningful job opportunities in mining, in tourism, in agriculture, in land management, and in getting rid of the red and green tape that is preventing those very jobs from booming. I might add, I'm proud to say, that as with, so, as with so many other important issues, you will only get genuine debate here on Sky News Australia. You won't get it on the ABC, that's for sure. So I'll be watching Chris Kenny's special tonight here on Sky at 9pm, and make sure you are too. But I would just add that as with any normal business proposal, or so many other aspects of what is being inflicted upon us in the culture wars, it is up to those who are advocating for a radical change to demonstrate why it is necessary, more importantly, what it will achieve, what are its KPIs, its key performance indicators, and why those who raise legitimate concerns, such as myself, are wrong. Instead, from the two most powerful people whose job it is to convince the rest of us that the voice is not just some tokenistic thing for black people, it's not just a stunt, it's not just virtue signalling, that it has value and it doesn't just determine people by the colour of their skin. We got this. And here he is. Hello, Hey. How are you? How are you going? Good to Hello, see you. Australia. Nice to see you. Hello. Hello. Man. How are you? I'm oh, well, thank you. Nice to see you. <laughs> I'm here in your country. Whenever you need from me, you just let me know. Fantastic. Appreciate thank you. you guys. Congratulations to you guys. And everyone knows Shaq loves Australia. All right? Awesome. Thank you. All right, I'll see you soon. That's right. Have a good time. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. I need that government clearance, too. <laughs> That'll be done.